All right, so just to start off, this is our agenda for today. Uh, we'll be introducing ourselves and uh, like I said, we'll be going through our pre-submitted questions first, and then in the remaining time, we'll go over the live Q and A's. So really excited to be able to talk about this subject. Every time that we've hosted an Ask a Biller, questions have come through about secondary claims, how to do secondary billing. So uh, really excited to be able to offer this. Um, so what we'll be talking about today, we're gonna start really general, and then we'll be going really in depth. Um, we have the best person here to do that. We have Susan, who I'll introduce. I'll have her introduce herself in just a second. Um, but what we will not be talking about today in great detail is secondary claims um, in relation to how simple practice works. Um, there, I will at the end be talking about how to bill secondary claims electronically with simple practice. Um, but for that specific subject, if you have questions about how your simple practice account works, and um, if you need help with a specific claim issue relevant to how your simple practice account works, I would point you to our help center at support.simplepractice.com and to our insurance specialist who will be able to look into your account and help you with some of those account specific issues. Um, but today we'll be talking about billing in general and uh, yeah, really excited to get to it. So without further ado, our speaker for today is Susan Frager. Susan? Hi everyone, welcome. Um, I'm excited you could join us. Um, you can read my bio here, so I'm not gonna read it to you. Um, I have an interesting background in that I was previously in LCSW. I now work as a biller and have done for the past 22 years, um, specific only to mental health. So I won't claim to say I've seen everything because I'm constantly presented with new things as the field is rapidly changing but probably i've seen a lot of stuff so great well susan we're happy to have you um, thank you and uh my name is maggie i am a partnership manager here at simple practice i've been working in the healthcare industry for about five years now and i am excited to be able to talk to providers about insurance um, happy to be able to help educate around this subject i think it's really important for um, providers to be educated in this subject that will help lots of people be able to afford care down the line. And so while it may seem mundane, uh, insurance is uh, and frustrating, but it is really important and um, thankful to all of you for being here and willing to learn. All right, so let's get into the questions. Uh, our first question, uh, and this one, like I said, we'll be starting very general, but uh, what is secondary billing? Susan, can you help clarify for us? Sure. We're going to be spending the next hour talking about it, but essentially what it is is when a person has more than one insurance plan, you have to determine which one's primary, which one's secondary, and we'll be talking about that right up here in a few minutes. You bill the primary plan, you receive an adjudication back, and then it's best to think about it in a paper claims format. What you would do to bill a secondary claim is you would send a claim out to the secondary payer along with the explanation of benefits from the primary payer so that the secondary payer knows what the primary payer did. Now, obviously, in today's world, there's all kinds of electronic ways to make that happen, and Maggie will talk about that a little bit at the end, but that is in its most simple form is what secondary billing is. Yeah, so two insurance companies there. And our next question, whoop, we're going backwards. Um, how do we determine which policy is the primary um, and is it still according to birth date? Please address this. That is probably one of the most crucial questions in this whole topic. And the birthday rule is a thing. Um, for those of you who don't know what the birthday rule, it's specific to children who are covered under the policies of two natural parents. The birthday rule says that whichever policy is first goes according to which parent has the earliest birthday in the calendar year. So it's not which parent is older, but if one parent is born in April and the other parent is born in September, then it would be the parent born in April whose policy is first. But 
I have a cheat sheet for you and it's three pages long <laughs> of all the coordination and benefits rules out there. And I can guarantee you it's not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of rules. It's not just the birthday rule. Primary and secondary coordination of benefits is a very situational thing. And, and what coordination of benefits is, is the process by which the two payers determine who's primary and who's secondary. So what we decided to do is if anybody wants that cheat sheet, my email address will be at the end of this presentation. Just email me and I'll send it right out to you. Yes, and one thing I should mention that I didn't at the top is that we will be recording this webinar and a recording of this will be sent out after the webinar. So you will have a chance to listen back. Um, but um, as Susan mentioned, there is a fundamental uh, element to deciding which is primary and which is secondary or determining which is primary and which is secondary. And that is something that you hit on Susan, COB, um, which stands for coordination of benefits. Leads us to our next question. What is coordination of benefits and why is it important with regard to secondary claims? It's crucial. And yet it's one of the most misunderstood things I see on a daily basis. Coordination of benefits, as I said, is the process by which insurance plans work together to determine who is primary and who is secondary. It's, yes. Yes, next slide. <clears throat> There's an agreed upon set of industry and CMS regulations. And just to make life interesting, it constantly changes. And that's why I said it's very, very situational. It's your specific patient and what are the key points. For instance, do they qualify for Medicare? Do they qualify for Medicaid? How old are they? What kind of other coverage do they have? It's very, very complicated. And I strongly recommend you not try to be the one to take the responsibility to determine primary and secondary. Um, but with regards to secondary claims, if the coordination of benefits is not completed, you will get denials and we'll be going over how to address those denials. Yes, and we're going to talk about some of those scenarios, but I think the most important thing to hit on with coordination of benefits is that it is not a choice for the patient necessarily in most cases. So uh, I think a no, lot of... Never. Yeah, <laughs> just about never. Um, so I think a lot of patients, when they have two insurance companies, think of it, don't don't think of it by these strict rules. They've never had to to wrap their head around that. They just think double the insurance, double the coverage. I'll pick the better, you know, I'll be able to like just hand you two cards. Um, right, like you know, if you're in network with this one but not in that one, well, we'll go with this one. Or this copay is lower, so we'll go with that one. Mm -mm, doesn't work that way unfortunately, and it's a big disappointment to patients when they realize that. And so that leads us to our next question, which is, oh, here, we, there's a second point that we hit on, patients never get to decide. Um, what if the patient doesn't know which plan is primary and which is secondary? How do we handle that, that situation? My first suggestion is don't guess. Do not assume even though I'm going to be sending you a cheat sheet, do not assume that you know. Because even if you're right, if the patient doesn't know, then chances are the coordination of benefits hasn't been done. And if it's not done formally with both insurance payers, you're going to have claims denials. So here's what I suggest. You can start by either calling the panels, both of them, let's say the person has Aetna and Cigna. So you call Aetna, you call Cigna, and they tell you, yeah, we know about this other policy, or no, we don't. Yeah, we're secondary. Yeah, we're primary. Or you could use platforms like Availity or Navinet, whatever you use. And frequently, they'll tell you if they know that there's another payer. And then what you would want to do is you would want to advise your, pa your patient, maybe their parents, if your patient is a child, to reach out to both insurance plans. And frequently, I get a lot of resistance from this. Patients say, why do I have to do this? They should know. 
Well, unfortunately they don't. And because of HIPAA regulations, they just don't share information back and forth the way people think they, they do. You do have to take the initiative. Now, one way a patient can update coordination of benefits is by calling. There are also member specific forms that are found on really all payer websites that you can download. And most payers now have secure patient portals where people can log in and submit like an electronic coordination of benefits where they essentially fill out a form and they say, okay, I've got my other insurance is Blue Cross and here's what you need to know. And then the insurance company processes it. And generally once the patient submits it, it does take about 10 days. And it, we talked about this before, you know, for um, patients that are having trouble with this, potentially providing them with resources for how they can do it themselves, just providing them with that phone number for the insurance um, and providing them with a link to that, to that website so that they are able to just walk themselves through it. Um, but again, not trying to, to go on this great adventure to solve the mystery yourself, um, but encouraging them well, to do it as well. With few exceptions, I mean, I have encountered exceptions, but for the most part, an insurance plan is not going to take coordination of benefits information from a provider or a biller. They're going to insist on talking to the patient. Mm -hmm. So you can give your patients a lot of resources, but ultimately the patient does have to do it or be responsible for the bill. So it is really encouraged. It really is critical that you be a coach and a partner with your patient. Yes, sorry, my slides are flipping back and forth a little bit, but on to our next question. What do I do if each plan is denying, stating that they are not the primary payer? Oh, that is always fun. First, you take a deep breath, because it is frustrating. If the patient has already done the coordination of benefits and they tell you that they've done it, then it should, hear the emphasis on should, please, it should be a simple matter of just calling the plans, talking to their claims customer service reps and saying, coordination of benefits was done. Can you please research it and reprocess this claim? And the customer service rep should be able to tell you that yes, the coordination of benefits was updated or no, it wasn't. And if it wasn't, unfortunately, you're going to hit a wall and you're going to have to go back to the patient and ask them to do it. All right, and we have some some reasons here for how this could happen. Oh yeah, and the number one reason, believe it or not, I've put it in quotes because it's just my term, it's a fishing expedition. A lot of times there is no other carrier, but they deny for coordination of benefits anyway. Um, you get that denial code, which I grind my teeth every time I see it is this, care may be covered by another plan per coordination of benefits. And they just wanna know because, hey, if somebody else is responsible, why should I pay this and then have to recoup it? Um, a lot of times you'll see this at the beginning of, of a year or if the coordination of benefits hasn't been done in more than 12 months. Sometimes it has to do with critical ages uh, such as age 26 or age 65. Um, if there's ever been a, an auto liability or a worker comp claim, they'll look into that because they might want to try to say that that your claim should be the responsibility of the liability carrier. There's a lot of reasons. And, and sometimes the reasons aren't really all that important because if you get a denial for COB, it has to be addressed. Yes, and so that leads us to our next point. which is here that regardless of the reason the pairs want to know about the coordination of benefits, a claim will not be paid unless the patient takes action and contacts the payer. Yes, and again, I do get a lot of resistance from patients and providers about this. And over the years, I've, I've changed my protocols and way of thinking about this. I used to be more of a babysitter to patients and just call them, hey, have you done your COB yet? And that was maybe a little friendlier and a little nicer, but it didn't work too well because people don't like to have to call insurance companies. Gee, wonder why. <laughs> so 
I started reading some insurance contracts and discovered that it really is permissible to bill the patient for the denied amount. Just put a note on there, on your bill that says, look, you don't have to be responsible for this balance if you do the coordination of benefits. And then maybe a, a, a follow that up with a form letter, which you can develop for your practice that explains coordination of benefits in general and encourages patients to do this because why should they have to pay? They, they shouldn't have to pay. And so a lot of times when I do that, I get a, a kind of a frustrated call from the patient saying, I don't know why I should have to do this, blah, blah, blah. They complain. I educate. And I say, look, we don't want you to have to pay this bill, but you're receiving this because it's critical you do this because your doctor will not be paid unless you do this. Right. And it, and it really is one of the easiest solutions to resolve in terms of a claim denial. Um, one thing I will note that I've come across in and having billed in the behavioral health space before is even after the patient does complete the COB, um, sometimes the claim won't automatically reprocess. Sometimes you you may have to, so you may be Absolutely. asking, okay, I know my client said they did it. My, my claim is still denied. I still haven't been paid. What do I have to do? So you may need to follow up. You may need to ask them, hey, can you reprocess this claim? The COB has been updated. Um, what I so generally do, Maggie, is that is a very good point. You almost always have to call back because they don't, typically send the claims for reprocessing because insurance companies have COB departments that don't, that sometimes work independently of the claims department. So what I do is I have a tickler system to where if my patient says, let's say they tell me today that they called, I note the account, I set a tickler for 10 business days, and then I call on that 10th day, hey, did you know Joe Schmo? Uh, do his coordination of benefits and I'm either told yes and the claims will then be resent for reprocessing or no sorry they didn't in which case then I go back to the patient. Right and so it's it's important to follow up with those and really make sure that you do see through. Um, okay so our next question is in what cases can I expect the primary claim to go automatically to the second payer? Um, and this is important especially when you're working electronically with claims to know when do you need to actually create the secondary claim and when do you not need to? It, uh, that, that would be ideal if we could always count on plans crossing over. In reality, there's, there's limited scenarios and the answer is really on this slide, but even the most basic like Medicare and a supplement or Medicare and Medicaid, if the policies are new, with each other and haven't been coordinated properly, then you're not gonna see a crossover. Um, and there's lots of different reasons for why you might not see a crossover. Again, it's one of those things where, yeah, you could try to find out why, but really all you need to do is just check on the claim after a certain amount of time. And if the secondary payer says we haven't received it, then you send it. And one thing I'll note on the type of remittances that you get um, when there is a crossover, um, especially within simple practice, you may see a remittance that comes from a, a Medicare and a supplement, but it the whole payment says it came from Medicare. Um, so it's really important to actually go through that remittance and uh, you may need to manually edit where those payments came from so that it doesn't look like you were overpaid or like so that your accounting is accurate and you know that there were two separate payments from a Medicare and a Medicaid, a Medicare and a TRICARE. Um, so just be mindful of that um, is one thing that I will, I will note here. My, I will add uh, just briefly, mm -hmm. my general time frame to follow up with a secondary payer is about 30 days after the primary adjudication. If you haven't gotten anything back from that secondary payer after about 30 days, that's when I would give them a call. And and that's a, a great way to set um, reminders for yourself so that you don't let these things slide. So I think that's a, a great note for everyone to like use 30 days as a benchmark, set a note in your calendar, set an alert so that you know that you can follow up on that claim again. Um, and just if you haven't gotten paid, give them a call. Um, 
All right, so another question. How can I anticipate how much my client owes when they're this working is with this? This is a lot of fun, and it's a great question. And I wish it would be as simple as just verifying benefits on both plans and saying, oh, okay, here's the benefits for the primary, here's the benefits for the secondary. Now we know. Mm, no. It's because plans have their benefit structure. In other words, it's a $20 copay or it's a $300 deductible. But then they also have what is known as coordination of benefits provisions. That's buried in the legalese of the plan. And it specifically spells out how the plan is going to coordinate with a primary payer in the event that the plan is secondary. And there may be multiple COB provisions, for instance, a set that says, all right, this is how we're going to coordinate with a primary commercial payer. And oh, this is how we're going to coordinate with Medicare. And the frustrating thing is, most customer service reps, if you ask for the COB provisions when you verify benefits, you're going to get a blank. You're going to get, huh, from the customer service rep. They are not going to know what you're talking about. They probably don't even have access to them. If you specifically want to know it, you'd probably need to talk to a claims adjudicator or a supervisor if you could access that person, or you'd have to have your, ben your client talk to their benefits manager. And I strongly suggest that you not even go down this path unless you have a question about how a claim is processed. Because it's a lot easier for a claims rep to look at a specific claim and tell you why it processed the way it did than to do it in the abstract when they don't have a claim. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Maggie. I was just okay. going to say, having said that, we're going to go through some calculations here in the next few slides that'll kind of illustrate some of the reasons why I'm saying it's not as easy as just verifying the benefits. And so I think for a rule of thumb, because uh, we, we do always highly, uh, over and over again in these webinars, always um, reinforce verifying benefits, verifying benefits is so important. Um, so in this case, I really think it's verifying a, that both coverage, both plans are active, and B, the primary coverage is, is going to be important to know because that's the base of what the secondary is going to be paying. So if you're familiar with exactly what the, the client would owe with just one insurance, then you can have an idea for um, what the secondary, and, and here we'll talk about some of these. Um, these slides seem like they got out of... Uh, Oh, no, you're good, Maggie. I, I think your, your, your main point is correct. You do need to verify the benefits, and I would especially focus on the primary, primary plan, primary plan's benefits, because that's your base. That's what you're going to start with. And I think it'll make a little more sense if we go through it and we look at some calculations from both angles, and then you can see where those coordination of benefits provisions will influence what that secondary plan pays. Yes. Because that's really our key is, what is the secondary plan going to pay? Yes. Um, so this is where we'll start getting into the calculations. I was thinking they were coming in the next slide. But um, let's talk about specific scenarios. So Pamela asks, what if I am out of network with the primary, but in network with the secondary? What does that look like? Yes, that's correct. So I'm going to give you first an answer of what you do and then follow it up with a calculation. So what you would do first is, even though you're out of network with the primary, you still have to file first to the primary. It, it, this has absolutely nothing to do with your network status. You have to go to the primary plan. Okay. When your primary plan pays or denies it, either one, you or puts it to the deductible, you file to the secondary plan policy with who you participate. So that's the mechanics of it. And um, the simple practice staff will be there to help walk you through the process in simple practice, but here we're just talking about the kind of the basic billing theory. So now we're going to look, uh, Maggie, if you can go to the next slide, we're going to look at some calculations. So with insurance one, remember you're out of network. You build $125. Primary payer, let's say, pays $55. And because you're out of network, the patient responsibility is $70. All right, so this is a pretty pretty basic. Right, 
and, and we're going to assume that if there's a deductible, then it's already been met. Okay, so here's where it gets fun. With insurance two, because you're participating, your contracted rate is $75. So there are actually three different scenarios that could happen which show the interaction of the coordination of benefits provisions and the actual benefits. So one is really straightforward. Your contract rate is 75, you've been paid 55, so policy two pays 20. Then you're expected to write off the rest because you're, you've now earned your contract rate. Simple, easy, and that's what you would think would happen. But let's say policies two, policy two's copayment is higher than $20. Let's say policies two copay is $40. Well, policy two could say, well, policy pay, policy one has already paid more than they would have paid if they were primary. Now, now that, that kind of requires some twisted thinking, but think about it this way. If policy two was the primary policy, 75 would be allowed, they would take off the $40 copay, their payment would be 35. So because you've been paid 55 by the primary, they're gonna say, we're not gonna replace that. You've already been paid more than we were going to pay you. So in this instance, you're gonna get a zero, but you are allowed to charge the patient $20, which is the difference between what policy one paid and your contracted amount with policy two. And it's important to remember that even though it feels like you're being cheated, the patient is still getting a break because if they would have only had the policy two, they would have had to pay 40. So they're getting a break because now they only have to pay 20. And in the final scenario, let's say policy two has a deductible that hasn't been met. In this case, they apply that $20 to the deductible and the patient owes it. And the rest is your write-off. So I think um, the biggest point here is that you are not going to get paid more than you are contracted to be able to be paid for from even if you are in network with the secondary plan. Um, Correct. As, You're in network with secondary regardless of your network status with primary. You are not going to get more than your contract rate. Now we didn't. I I don't think create a slide for this, Maggie. But I always get the question, and it's really interesting. Well, what if I'm in network with both? And what if the secondary contract rate is higher than the primary? That's a real fun one because different payers have different interpretations about what you can and can't charge. I would say that to be safe, always go with the primary payers allowed amount if you're in network with both. Okay, that is good to note. Um, and that, well, it should be included in the cheat sheet, maybe. <laughs> uh, just as, a, as like a, a maybe a secondary point. Um, but all right, our next question is, what if I'm in network with the primary, but out of network with the secondary? So a reversal of the previous question. Okay. Um, in some ways, that makes it a whole lot easier. Because at this point, filing to the secondary is really optional. I would say, file to the primary and of course verify your benefits so that you know what the patient is going to owe let's say if they only had that primary insurance and the primary will work just like any other they're going to pay your contracted rate minus any deductible co-insurance or copay then what you're going to have done is you're going to have verified the secondary plan you're going to find out since you're out of network you're going to find out well first of all do they have out of network benefits and then if they do what are those benefits? Because it might be that the out-of-network benefits just aren't even worth bothering if let's say they have a $10,000 out-of-network deductible, it's probably going to be the case that the patient will never meet it unless they've had some out-of-network surgery or something. And the patient may say, you know what, it's not even worth it, I'll just pay my copay and we'll be done with it. But let's just say you decide you're gonna file now we're gonna have some calculations. All right. 
So for ease of calculations, I've, I've used the same numbers. You're in network with the primary, their allowed amount is 75, the primary policy has a $20 copay, and the primary paid $55. So scenario one is if the secondary has a deductible that's not met, they're gonna take that $20 copay, apply it to their deductible, and the patient owes $20. And again, you have to abide by your contracted amount of the primary payer. And I think there were so many um, calculations on this particular one that we didn't even have room to put them on the slide. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go over with them verbally, and then if you want that, uh, if you want that slide, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Okay. So let's say the secondary plan just has a copay, but let's say that copay is higher than twenty dollars. Remember, you're out of network. The copay for out of network is often going to be very steep. So let's say the copay is $50, okay. Well, the secondary plan can say, hey, look, copay is 50, but this patient only owes 20. And the first $50 of anything the patient owes is going to be considered copay. So no, sorry, we're not gonna pay. You would then just simply say, okay, it sucks, but collect your $20 from the patient and move on. So now let's say the secondary has a coinsurance instead of a copay. And I'm sure everybody knows this, but I'll just reiterate a coinsurance is a percent, a copay is a fixed dollar amount. So let's say the secondary coinsurance is 50%. Again, remember you're out of network, it's not going to be great. The secondary could pay $10, in other words, half of the copay, leaving the patient responsible for the other 10. Or the secondary plan may have COB provisions that state they're not going to pay any more than they would if they were primary. Okay. Sometimes secondary plans do that. They'll say, well, yeah, I know we're secondary, but we're only going to pay no more than we would if we were primary. Because you've been paid more than $37.50, which is 50% of 75, remember you're out of network, they're not going to pay you so the patient would still owe 20. So that's why sometimes when you're in network with the primary, but out of network with the secondary, unfortunately, there's not necessarily going to be much benefit coverage. My suggestion is always file it at least once so that you can see how it turns out. If you're not, if you don't understand the result you get, call in, speak to a claims customer service rep, they'll go over it with you at that point. They'll say things like, well, the second, the, the COB provisions state, we're not gonna pay more than we would if we were primary. Okay, now you understand why they're telling you that. And at that point, you know that, you well, know, it's just not worth filing with secondary. And, and this is a, end, a, a pretty good opportunity for client education too, if your client is being ins insistent that you continue to try? Um, it, well, yes, although I was going to also add that plans have what's called an out-of-pocket amount, and especially a client that has had a lot of medical stuff may want you to continue to file because they may reach their out-of-pocket amount, and once they reach their out-of-pocket amount, which happens around this time of the year, then their insurance plan would pay. So there would be a reason to continue to file, or it might be that they have a health savings or a flex spending, which they can use that money to pay their patient responsibility, but their plan requires a claim on file in order for them to access that money. So there are going to be reasons where you're like, oh my God, this is stupid, why should I have to file? I'm not getting anything. But your patient may have very valid reasons for wanting you to continue to file. Mm -hmm. And if you're out of network, one thing to keep in mind is you can tell the patient, look, I'll give you a super bill. You take care of it. They're, you're, they're secondary. I'm out of network. Here's your super bill. We're done. And that's just a practice decision. Yes. Um, that's a great point. Uh, again, because they're in this scenario, out of network does imply that you're not contractually obligated to do that for the patient. So it would be um, a consideration or a courtesy. 
Um, all right, so our next question is, uh, why didn't the secondary payer cover the full coinsurance, copay, or deductible leftover from the primary? So this is pretty much just a summary question of what we've already talked about. So here's the slide that's the key takeaway, which is that if the secondary payer has language in their legal terms of the policy, that states they are never going to reimburse the provider more than their own allowed amount, then they may not pay at all or may pay only in part, even when you and or the patient think they should have. Unless, again, the patient has met their out-of-pocket, then that might change the scenario. All right. And our... Next question here. I just realized that the numbers are not right. So the last question said 18, but this one said eight. But um, we're getting close to the end of our questions. Uh, I filed to what I thought was the primary plan and the secondary. The claims are now settled. Now one of the plans is coming back and saying there was an error in the COB. They want their money back. What do I do? Michelle, that is a really great question. And it happens more often than you might think. First of all, Take a deep breath, calm down. I know it's frustrating. The first thing you need to do is immediately bill the payer that you thought was secondary, change the filing order so that all claims go out as primary. And simple practice can help you with this because when you file an electronic claim, there's what's called an indicator on that EDI that says I'm filing as the primary or I'm filing as the secondary. You need to make sure that that indicator says you're primary. No, okay. The first thing to keep in mind is that depending on how long this has been, you may be past your timely filing limit. File the claims anyway. I don't care because you can appeal those denied claims on the grounds that the COB wasn't done or the COB information given wasn't correct. And a lot of times it's just as simple as sending in the supporting documentation. And that supporting documentation would be that other payers request for a refund, which will say right on there that we were not the primary payer at the time. Okay. So that's the first step. Then you wait for the other payer, the payer that you originally thought was secondary, you wait for them to respond. If the other payer pays, great. Then refund the original prime, the original first plan to pay refund them, and then rebuild them as, as secondary with that secondary indicator on it. And then they shouldn't deny for timely filing because the date on the primary, the, the, the actual primary payer, the one who just paid you, the date on that remittance is going to be recent. So it's not a timely filing issue because it's based on the date of the primary payer's adjudication, not the date of service. So that's the best case scenario. Then there's the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is there may be a battle between the payers over who was primary versus secondary. And this is, I'm going to emphasize again, this is why your patients need to hammer out their coordination of benefits issues promptly. Is because if they do, then you're not going to get into situations where two years down the road, you're fighting this battle and then your patient is long gone. So if your patient has done what they're supposed to do at the time they're supposed to do it, you're not going to be facing this. But all hope is not lost. If there's a battle, okay, you can still get it paid, but it's gonna take some work. What you wanna do is you wanna contact what's called the overpayment recovery department of the first payer that paid you, the one that now wants their money back. What overpayment recovery can do is they can listen to the situation and they have the power to halt an automatic recoupment for a specified period of time. And what an automatic recoupment is, is I'm sure you've seen this and, and gotten very frustrated, but what it is is when the plan says, oh, you owe us $100, you haven't paid us, so we're just gonna take it out of your next check. If you talk to overpayment recovery and tell them that you're working on it and that it's a COB issue, they can say, all right, fine, we'll halt automatic recoupments for a specified period of time. Just call us back and advise us of what's going on. They can do that. And they're usually very nice about it. 
but you have to call overpayment recovery. You can't call customer service. And to get the phone number for overpayment recovery, it's going to be on the letter that you got sent saying that you owe us money. There will be a separate phone number and it'll be right there on the um, letter demanding money. In some cases, it might be an email, so then email, but that's what you wanna do first. Then the next thing you wanna do is you want to call the COB department. Insurance companies have their own COB department. Now, sometimes you can't access the COB department, so then you would talk to the customer service rep and you would at that point be allowed to request a COB inquiry because you have claims that are now being disputed. And simply, you know, be nice, explain what happened, and ask for their help. Say, can you institute a formal inquiry? And then what will happen is both the one plan you're calling, who wants their money back, is going to reach out to the other plan and they're going to settle it. Okay. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do is reach out to your patient, who might be your ex patient at this time. Please be diplomatic. I know it's frustrating. Try to get your patient on your side. And just be real clear with them that, look, I need your help. And the reason I'm asking for your help is because I want to avoid billing you. I don't want to have to bill you. If we work together, we can avoid me having to bill you. And mm -hmm. most patients, I think, I mean, they're they're frustrated. They don't like their insurance companies, but they respond really well to to you when they when they hear that you really don't want to make them pay. And sometimes it just takes um, education, persistence, but you can get it corrected. It it sometimes does take 60 to 90 days. It is a pain. Um, but again, stay in touch with overpayment recovery so that they don't recoup. Well, that was great. That was, um, I'm sure, helpful to a lot of people who are going through um, clawbacks or takebacks. We're going to have a webinar next, I think, like in a few months that specifically talks about the, all of those scenarios. Um, and the next thing that we're going to talk about is something that comes up a lot when we talk about secondary claims, um, which is Medicare. And this is um, the basis of a lot of the questions that we got is working with Medicare and secondary payers. So let's, uh, the first question, is Medicare always primary? Easy answer, no, it is not. Do not assume that Medicare is always primary. In my cheat sheet that if you want, and if you wanna email me, I'll send you the cheat sheet. It goes over a bunch of scenarios and there's even links to Medicare's site that go into it even further. So I strongly suggest that if you deal with Medicare at all, email me and I'll send you over my, my cheat sheet because it is extremely complicated. Um, so the short answer is no, but let's get into some more specifics here. Um, what if Medicare is primary and I can't take Medicare? I'm not a Medicare provider. Um, will the secondary pay? That is a tough one. And one of the things I hate about my job is that I'm frequently the bearer of bad news. And this is really a tough one because Medicare no longer accepts claims for denial purposes only. Used to be you could just send a claim right on there for denial purposes only. Medicare would send you a denial and then you'd file to the secondary. But they don't do that anymore. Just contacting the secondary payer and saying your license is excluded from Medicare is really tough because quite frankly, there's a lot of people at these payers that really don't understand. They deal with a lot of medical specialties and mental health is only a small percentage of what they deal with. So they may not understand when you say an LPC is excluded from Medicare. And if that weren't enough, a lot of people's secondaries are what are called Medigap or supplement policies. Those plans do what's called follow Medicare guidelines, which means they're only gonna pay if Medicare pays, okay? And then let's say the person really does have a secondary plan, meaning it works independently of Medicare, some of them are gonna say right out, well, okay, we'll only reimburse 20% because we're not going to replace Medicare. So you could be fighting very hard for not a lot of money. 
and I think we're going to talk about this um, more in the next slide, but that's really um, something to hit on is that Medicare supplement plans will only pay if Medicare does. So supplement plans may have names of like maybe sponsored by plans that you are in network with. Like you may see a Cigna or mm -hmm. an Aetna in there. Um, it doesn't mean that you also are in network with that plan. Um, Very good point, and I'll have some uh, tips for that when we get there. All right, so then can we explain what is the difference between a secondary and a supplemental plan? I, I pretty much touched on it, but there's a slide that explains it in, in pretty simple detail. A supplement is designed to work according to the guidelines of the primary payer. In other words, if the primary pays, so will the supplement. A secondary plan is simply an independent plan. It's got its own provisions. It's unrelated to the primary policy. It was never intended to work in tandem with the primary policy. It's just a policy that you have, however you got it. So Medicare supplement policies. A lot of them are going to be people you've never heard of, like Mutual of Omaha, or Banker's Life, or, or Thrivent, or there's a million of them out there. Generally speaking, those are pretty identifiable because it will usually say Medicare supplement policy. But some of the the plans that we know and love, like Aetna or Cigna, they have their own line of Medicare supplement now. And what they've done is they've bought up a lot of these smaller supplements and they've rebranded them as Aetna or even CVS Medicare supplement. So if the card does not say Medicare supplement on it, look for a letter. Plan G, Plan N, Plan F. Um, there are specific Medicare supplement plans and they're all designated with a letter. And I have a handout I could send you if you wanted that as well. And every year they change slightly and you can always just Google it by um, getting the new one like for 2021 by going to 2021 Medicare supplement plans. It might not be ready yet, but it should be coming out here in the next, well, I don't know, month. So if it says supplement plan N or supplement plan G, you know it's a Medicare supplement, regardless of whether it says Aetna. And it's going to work in tandem with Medicare and it is not going to pull from the Aetna network. One of the things about Medicare supplements is there is no network for a Medicare supplement. If Medicare pays, they will pay. Doesn't matter whether you're in or out of network with Aetna or Cigna or any of these. Um, so that that is really, I think, super important to, to understand, especially for those of you who are working with Medicare population. Um, I think that is huge and was really helpful for me in understanding why I've had I've run into some issues that I have had with billing to Medicare and secondaries and supplements. Um, so what if I am contracted with Medicare, but I am out of network with the secondary? Okay, so again, I'll, I'll reiterate, it, it kind of is important to understand whether your secondary payer is a supplement, because if it's a supplement, you're, you don't have to worry about that. Just file the claim, or in a lot of cases, Medicare will cross it over, but if not, then just file the claim and they'll pay. And if the secondary payer is independent, then you would follow the same protocol that we've already talked about, just like anything else, file the claim and it will work a lot. It, the way it will work is based in that secondary payer's language regarding how this secondary plan is going to behave when Medicare is primary. All right, and how can I be sure my secondary claim is going through? Ask Barbara. That's probably one of the easier questions you would follow up on a secondary claim the way you would follow up on a primary claim. You'd use Availity, you, you'd use Navinet, you'd go to any provider portal you're used to using, you'd call and check on it. Hey, you know, I filed this claim, here's the member ID, um, here's the data service, here's my tax ID, NPI, all that stuff. Can you check on this claim for me? And they'll tell you, yeah, it's in process, or yeah, we've we've issued a check, it's on the way, or no, we never we never get it. We didn't get it, send it again. It, it works just like any 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 claim. Yes, and so if you're working with um, simple practice and you are enrolled to receive ERAs, otherwise known as payment reports in the system, then you will see claim updates 
for the secondary claim as you would with any other claim. Um, but to the point if you're mailing it or if you are sending it through another portal, then you may want to follow up with the payer and um, check with them just by giving them a call. Okay, so to talk about Medicaid a little bit, what if Medicaid is secondary and I don't take Medicaid? All right, this is a tough one because Medicaid is a state-based program, so that means there's going to be 50 answers, okay, one for each state. So the first thing you want to do is look at your state's Medicaid regulations. And the way Medicaid, and to some extent, and Medicare also, I would say, is there is a presumption that if you're eligible to build a plan, that you are going to be participating, okay? If you choose not to enroll, that's your choice, but you're still obligated to behave as if you had enrolled, okay? That's really important to understand what the government payers is. It doesn't work like a commercial policy where you say, I'm out of network, I can do anything I want. Don't play that game with the government because you're gonna lose. Um, one thing to keep in mind is there's an abbreviation um, of a certain type of Medicaid recipient known as a QMB, stands for Qualified Medicare Beneficiary. If your patient is a QMB, you are never allowed to bill the patient ever, ever under any circumstances. And I've got a link there down at the bottom. You can follow it up. And I don't know if that's the entire link, but I, I have it and can send it to you. If the patient is not a QMB, it would, the answer would be depending on your state's Medicaid regulations. I would say that when in doubt, it's probably better not to bill a Medicaid patient because that way you're never gonna get in trouble. Uh, if you want to research it, some states do say, for instance, um, I think New York is one where they say, you know, if the Medicaid patient is not a QMB, knows in advance that you don't take Medicaid, agrees in writing to pay, you know, all these things, then yes, you can bill them. Um, but again, keep in mind, there's a reason Medicaid exists and just be sensitive about it is what I would say. All right, and then that's a good segue into our next question, which is, what is a payer of last resort? When we talk about Medicaid, um, how does that, that play into that? Any, any, plan, any plan that is designated as a payer of last resort means it's easier to determine coordination of benefits because it's always going to be last in any group of plans that a patient might have. Medicaid is the most common payer of last resort. If somebody has one or two other plans and Medicaid, you know that Medicaid comes last. Um, they are not the only payer of last resort. Uh, um, another common one that you'll see is if you do any work with crime victims compensation, those are generally payer of last resort also, except for Medicaid. So Medicaid will always, always be payer of last resort, whoops. All right, so our final question here is, how do I file claims electronically? And I'll take this one from the simple practice perspective. So um, when you're filing claims with simple practice, it, you must have the client's secondary insurance on file. So when you submit the primary, you will wanna have, uh, you'll wanna make sure that you have both insurance companies listed in the client's profile. Um, once you have a fully adjudicated primary claim, you will be given an option to create a secondary claim. So you will, again, it's very important that we talked about the, the first step is always getting a finalized claim, whether that means it's a denial um, or it's been paid or it's been applied to deductible, but you need to have that primary claim finished first. And then at the top, you'll see the option um, right, right in the primary claim to create a secondary claim. Maggie, can I interrupt just a quick second? Yep. You mentioned something key, which is fully adjudicated. If that primary payer comes back and says, we're, deny we're pending or denying for coordination of benefits, that is not full adjudication. At that point, I strongly recommend you not file your secondary claim until you get the COB worked out. That's a great point because you're just gonna, that, that's just creating an issue on both ends. Exactly. <laughs> that way, creating an issue with the primary and the secondary. Um, you don't wanna accidentally get paid the full amount from the secondary and then have it um, 
turn into a mess. So um, fully adjudicated claim. So there are two different paths within simple practice when you're dealing with secondary claims. Um, the first is if you are enrolled to receive payment reports. So if the payer that you're working with, um, both payers, are set up in simple practice to send you remittance advices. So there would be an application process um, when you initially sign up with simple practice to set yourself up to receive your EOBs, otherwise known as payment reports, otherwise known as ERAs, um, the, the explanation of benefits. Um, if those are set up in your system, then when you create a secondary claim, it will automatically populate with all of the information that you need. It will essentially attach that remittance from the primary claim to the secondary claim when it goes to the um, insurance payer. So the most important things to look at when that claim is automatically created is it will populate box eight and box 24. That will distinguish it from just a regular primary claim. Um, and then if you are not enrolled to receive payment reports with simple practice, um, you'll want to talk to the payer. So you'll want to see if they will accept a, a, an electronic claim from uh, from our system. So if you manually enter the information in box eight and box 24, otherwise you may need to su submit those claims outside of simple practice by printing off the primary and sending it along with a primary explanation of benefits. Um, but I'm gonna show you what those two boxes look like in just a second so you have an idea of what information needs to go in those boxes. So again, these will automatically populate if you're set up to receive your remittances through simple practice, but otherwise you may need to manually add information here. So first box eight, will you'll need to add how much you were paid on the primary claim and what amount is remaining to be covered. So if you were paid $50 and you're contracted to receive 75 usually, um, you would, you would put down 25. That would include whatever the patient would owe as well. You want to include that in the remaining field here um, for the secondary to consider. And then in box 24, they'll need more specific information about um, the adjudication date, how much was paid, the quantity. As in mental health, it's usually always one. That would be the amount of units that would be um, that's related to the service. So uh, you'll put the CPT code, and then you'll also need to put the specific codes for, um, so if it was denied, you'll need to put a specific denial code in 1C. Um, and if it was applied to deductible, those codes vary um, from copay, coinsurance. Um, you'll be able to take all of that information from your primary explanation of benefits and put that into this claim when you file to secondary. Um, and again, the difference is, if you have your ERAs, all of this will populate automatically. If not, you'll need to look through that EOB and, and do this manually. And for a complete comprehensive guide and video on how to bill secondary claims within simple practice, I highly, highly recommend going to our help center and checking out this video. Um, this was made by our customer success team. And there is also a long guide there that will walk you through the specific steps and if you have any trouble at any point during that process, um, please reach out to our insurance specialist team. They're here to help and they're here to walk you through anything that you come up with here. Um, so the, the title of this is Filing Secondary Insurance Claims. Really easy to find, so that is a great resource. And then uh, one final plug here for our Ask a Biller series. We have um, a few more coming up. So Barbara Griswold will be helping me host the next three. We'll be talking about insurance fraud, um, we'll be talking about getting audited, and lastly, we'll be talking about joining insurance networks for anyone that is still building out a network and interested in joining a panel. And Susan, if you um, want to plug your information here. Oh, well, there's my uh, email, my phone. Um, if you choose to call me, remember I'm sitting on hold a lot with insurance companies, so be patient, I will get back to you. Um, just leave a message. Uh, my voicemail is confidential. Uh, my website is www.psychadminpartners.com and um, I'm here. Great, and everyone, if you are interested in that cheat sheet, jot this email down, um, reach out to Susan and she'll be able to send that to you. Um, it's a really awesome resource, which 
which just has a ton of information about coordination of benefits if you really want to um, have all of those rules and um, specifics on hand. Um, and then if you aren't currently using simple practice, uh, remember it, you can try it free for 30 days anytime, no credit card required, um, makes insurance billing super easy. I highly recommend. And if you are using simple practice, remember you can tell your friends who aren't to sign up and they get 50 and you, uh, sorry, you give $50 to them <laughs> and you get $50 for referring them. All right, everyone, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And we hope to see you at the next webinar for Ask a Biller. Um, otherwise, keep an eye out for an email that will have the recording. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Maggie.